Japan in the early 1980s was a truly wealthy nation, rivaling the colossal United States. The Japanese economy was second only to that of the United States at that time. The land of a square meter in the commercial districts of Tokyo reached as high as $25,000. In contrast, at the same time, the same land in an American commercial district was $1,000, a staggering 25 times lower. Its highly appreciated currency and a lot of global manufacturing giants like Toyota, Panasonic, Sony, Mitsubishi, and others made it seem like Japan would take over America and eventually become the next superpower. But it never happened. The glory days of Japan ended as the housing market crashed in the 1990, leading to a nationwide crisis and decades-long stagnation. To overcome this stagnation, it borrowed a lot of money to the point that it is now the most indebted nation in the entire world. Its debt reached 266% of its GDP in 2020. But how did the nation that shook the global trade with its low-cost mass manufacturing reach this point? This is the story of how the rising land of the sun has now become the rising land of debt. After recovering from the ashes of World War II, Japan emerged as a new global superpower. Its unique economic model allowed it to grow rapidly and efficiently, and it was called an Asian tiger. The Japanese economy of the early 80s was known for its huge returns on investment. It was considered a gold mine for investors and a luxury hotspot for wealthy people around the world to spend their money and enjoy every aspect of a truly developed economy. But in pursuit of infinite growth, the Japanese government took some huge steps that were unprecedented, not even in the highly industrialized Western world. One of these steps was to implement a quota system for Japanese banks. This meant that the government set targets for banks to create credit for specific industries, such as steel, electronics, and automobile. This helped to give investors incentives to make investments in certain sectors, which were beneficial for the economy over sectors that were not. The experiment was successful, and Japan seemed unstoppable. So much so, that the United States feared that Japan was going to overtake them to become the sole global superpower. The government of U.S., fearful of the destruction of the American car manufacturing industry, attempted to lower the trade deficit between America and Japan. And in 1981, it limited the number of cars that could be imported from Japan every year. And then it also introduced a whopping 45% tariff on Japanese motorcycles. But it abandoned such policies in fear of that. Japan would also exert sanctions on U.S. products coming into Japan, because U.S. and Japan heavily relied on each other for their economic growth. The large American population with the high purchasing power due to U.S. dollar purchased Japanese-made products due to their cost competitiveness. And on the other hand, Japan depended on export-led growth. But America did something remarkable in 1985, which proved to be the downfall of Japan in the coming years. In order to stabilize the exchange rates, the U.S. proposed an agreement to France, U.K., Germany, and Japan that the U.S. dollar was too high compared to British pound, French franc, German mark, and most importantly the Japanese yen, and they had to sell their massive amounts of dollar reserves to appreciate their domestic currency, and Bank of Japan did it. Hence, the price of yen started to rise against US dollar. This was a disastrous news for Japanese exporters, but for the common people, it was a blessing, as they saw their relative wealth increasing thanks to appreciated yen. In order to make Japanese exports globally price competitive again, the Central Bank of Japan lowered the interest rates, and this led to one of the craziest nationwide real estate bubbles of all time. During that time, the land of one square meter in the commercial districts of Tokyo reached as high as $25,000. In contrast, at the same time, the same land in an American commercial district was $1,000. The problem was, the cost kept on rising. It was only 1989 when Japanese central banks started to raise interest rate, but by a little. They never considered that it would create decades-long impact on the economy. And this is the point where the economic bubble started and marked the peak of Japanese economy. But that was just the beginning of the end of Japanese miracle.
the bubble crashed and millions of Japanese people saw their investments burn down. The collapse of land and stock prices caused many banks to suffer huge losses from non-performing loans. Many banks became insolvent and had to be bailed out by the government. This, in turn, affected the financing of businesses and households, and reduced investment and consumption. This led to massive layoffs from major companies around the nation, which resulted in skyrocketing unemployment. Since these companies were in crisis, they did not hire new young students who just graduated from the university. Since they worked so hard to be exceptional in the Japanese education system, they had to face social stigma. On top of that, even though many banks were bailed out by the Japanese government, 1997 was marked as the year of the Japanese banking crisis. This was the time when the whole Asia was already in crisis, since the start of the Asian financial crisis in July 1997. But Japan survived the crisis due to its large piles of foreign reserves. However, some major financial institutions failed during the Asian financial crisis. To combat the crisis, several banks had been saved by taxpayers' money and Japan was able to recover from the crisis earlier than its other Asian peers such as South Korea, Taiwan, and Indonesia. This was also the time when the Japanese economy got rid of its debt legacy of the real estate bubble, and Japan was ready to welcome the new 21st century. Before further moving on, if you have watched this video so far, then please hit the like and subscribe button to support the channel. As Japan entered the new century, it once again found itself in a deflationary decade. As we already know, the excessive debt problem in the private sector had finally been solved by bailing out banks, but that meant that a lot of that leftover debt was on the government balance sheet. And this was a recipe for stagnation and deflation in a highly indebted nation. Deflation encourages savings and discourages spending. Let's understand it with an example. If you are a Japanese and you want to buy a loaf of bread, which costs 100 yen, but if deflation happens, the same loaf of bread would eventually cost you less than 100 yen, and you would expect the price of bread to go down further. Eventually, you would end up buying nothing and wait for the price to go down further. If the same phenomenon happens on a national scale, since our economies run on demand and supply system, and considering the fact that the consumers are not buying anything in hope of that, the prices would go down further, the demand for the goods goes down as well as the supply is high because manufacturers and investors would also want to make profits. And this will eventually become a vicious cycle in which consumers are not buying anything, the supply is going higher and the consumer is still expecting the price to go down even more. This is the same thing that happened to Japan in the early 2000s. This is why most central banks aim for consistent mild inflation rather than total price stability. It not only helps governments to pay their debt, but also motivates consumers to spend their money rather than saving it. The Bank of Japan once again came up with another idea of quantitative easing. This meant that short-term interest rates, which could not be much lower than zero, and long-term rates, which would be higher to compensate lenders for the increased risk of default, could be driven down further by using newly created reserves to buy bonds. The Bank of Japan stated that they would stop the program right away once the deflation ends and inflation occurs. And while the unemployment in the nation dropped down significantly, the deflation did not. After several years of struggle in 2006, the Japanese government took a sigh of relief as mild inflation re-entered Japan and all of the people were thinking that the glory days of Japan would come back again. If this had not happened. The Japanese economy was hit hard by the global financial crisis. After the collapse of Lehman Brothers in America, Japan's economy contracted more than that of the United States. This was due to its over-reliance on exports. When the demand plunged in the US and Europe, the Japanese automobile and electronics industry saw their revenues declining. The Japanese banks were not fully recovered yet from their deflation period. Even though this time, the crisis was brought upon by foreign problems, this did not make it less of a problem for the Bank of Japan, and it once again found itself stuck in a deflationary period for another decade. In 2012, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe came into power, and the agenda that he introduced went on to be known as Abenomics, which consisted of reforms, higher quantitative easing, 
increased government spending and tax cuts for corporations. During his leadership, the Bank of Japan bought a lot of government debt and even entered the stock market to the point that now, the Bank of Japan owns 70% of all debt and also owns roughly 7% of the Japanese stock market. Shinzo Abe also introduced a lot of spending packages. Under his tenure, the government debt had reached 240% of the GDP, making Japan the most indebted nation in the entire world. Under his rule, he also introduced a lot of tax cuts, trade deals and deregulations for businesses and corporations. But these corporations never invested this extra money, but rather accumulated it. In 2015, this has reached to a point that these businesses have been saving up to 5% of their earnings every single year. The massive government spending had caused some inflation, but never reached the desired 2% point. Such series of crisis and lost hope for the future have also caused a social issue in the Japanese society, which is low birth rate. Even though, developed countries tend to have lower birth rates, but Japan takes it to another level. By 2070, it is expected that Japan will lose about 40% of its population. From 123 million in 2020 to 77 million in 2070. This also makes it hard for the Japanese economy to grow further, as there are fewer people to work than before. It also historically maintained a strict policy towards immigration and made it difficult for anyone to live in Japan who came from outside of Japan. But Japan has relaxed a lot of its policies towards immigration and now welcoming more and more foreigners into the country. Due to the healthy diet and lifestyle of Japanese people, they live a very long life. Around 20% of the people who have crossed the age of 100 are Japanese. This is one more positive side of Japanese culture, but this has caused a nationwide demographic crisis as there are not enough babies being born to replace the senior citizens of the society. This resulted in a rise in pensions, social health care system, and retirement age, leading to high stress levels, a highly competitive job market, and motivation to work more rather than advancing in social life. It is not just a lost decade anymore. They are lost decades. It has been more than three decades. But Japan is still looking for growth, and its economy is stagnated for a long time. Japan has been through a lot of things. Its search for infinite growth made it the second largest economy of the world. But there is still hope. Imagine what it looks like to be in stagnation for more than three decades. But Japan is still the third largest economy in the entire world, just behind US and China. There is something special in Japan that makes it harder for Western economists to predict its future. We can expect it to rise again, or to wait for its collapse, who knows. But there is another country in the South China Sea, a former Japanese colony, which also saw its glory times during the 1990s, but now is facing similar challenges as Japan. This nation is South Korea. And if you want to know about how South Korea is about to go extinct due to its economic miracle, check out the right video and I will see you there.